Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, my name is Jonathan Vallon. I'm the executive editor of The Absolute Sound. This is Julie Mullins. She is the managing editor of The Absolute Sound. I feel like I ought to begin the way Harpo Marx uh, began whenever he had to address a group. He, he'd start by saying, um, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, um, and I'm not accustomed to public speaking, but this is a special occasion. Um, it's customary to say that the person you're about to introduce needs no introduction. Well, the truth is, these folks don't need an introduction. Without them, we would not have the high end as we currently have it. Just in case you don't recognize everyone up here, uh, we have Cheryl Lee, David Wilson, Dan D'Agostino, of course, of Wilson Audio, Dan D'Agostino, of once uh, formerly of Corel, and I think currently of Corel, and Dan D'Agostino, Master Audio Systems. Kevin Hayes will be joining us uh, soon, of VAC, and Richard Vandersteen of Vandersteen Audio. Um, please give these guys a hand. They deserve it. Uh, Julie and I will be asking these, uh, this panel um, uh, a few of what we hope will be interesting questions, but we're going to save a little time at the end so that you can ask questions of your own. Um, uh, after the uh, seminar, uh, uh, we will be available and uh, some of our panelists will be available to sign books. Uh, the Absolute Sound is... Uh, has published two volumes of uh, a history of high-end audio. That's what it's called, Illustrated History of High-End Audio. And everybody on this panel is represented by a chapter in that book because everybody on this channel is a pioneer. Um, so with no further ado, Julie, you can begin asking questions. Okay. Hello, thanks for coming today. Uh, first question, how did you get hooked on high-end audio, and when and why did you decide to take it from a hobby and passion into a career? Anyone can start. <laughs> I got hooked on high-end audio when I got hooked on him. <laughs> um, through high school and college, I was performing and not listening. But then I met him. I walked into he and his roommate's uh, apartment and saw what I would learn later were I three Ico amplifiers glowing softly in the dark. And uh, I kind of wondered what all this stuff was. And I finally learned later what uh, high-end and what a marvelous experience it could be to listen to wonderful recordings of artists and, uh, and bands. So that's how I got hooked on okay, it. I got hooked on it um, actually uh, incrementally. Uh, and so it was uh, Christmas Eve in 1959 and I had no interest in audio. I wanted a chemistry set. and. Um, the one with potassium chloride in it. <laughs> yeah, the good ones, yes. And um, so, but there, there are uh, a bunch of uh, singers outside that were singing Christmas carols, and it was distracting, and I just wanted to get to sleep, you know? And, and uh, I looked out uh, the window, there was nobody outside. What I later found out was that our neighbor was an audiophile. And he had moved his clipshorn to the front porch and was playing Christmas carols uh, using a Weathers FM cartridge, uh, Fisher preamplifier, and Fisher power amplifier. Uh, and um, so that was my first uh, aha moment where I realized that I thought that was real. And so one thing leads to another, and uh, that's how I got started. 
Uh, I think that uh, I have to say it was probably my uh, my father who got me interested in it because he's uh, he always liked music and had a whole stack of, of records and um, he would play them on various pieces of equipment that he would buy and I got really hooked on the music part of it. And uh, it didn't occur to me to much later in life that I actually wanted to be in the business. I just wanted to. Can you turn up the audio? Okay. Okay. Um, it, it didn't. <laughs> Is everyone good had testing? Recording engineer sitting next to him. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it didn't occur to me to much later in life that I, I thought there, there was a place to have a business from it. I always enjoyed um, fixing and building my own stuff, but I never thought I would make it as, 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 a, as a, a, a business. I wanted to be an engineer, and um, I wanted to do something in engineering, but it was an audio. And when I, when I got out of engineering school, I went and... Um, and uh, walked into a high-end audio store and uh, started looking at the equipment, which I hadn't looked at for a long time, and really got extremely interested in it because there was a bunch of really different things going on at that time, and uh, products from the UK and all over the world and quad electrostats and those kind of things, and I got kind of fascinated with it. And it wasn't until later in the, that I realized that there was a place in the audio market for something I had had in mind because I had looked at various different amplifier designs and I said, you know, I think, I think there's a way to make a 100 watt class A amplifier and that's pretty much how I got into business. Great, thank you. Um, next question, oh, uh, excuse me. Yeah, I'm sorry, guy. I'm so oh. sorry, please. <laughs> no problem. Um, well, uh, born of immigrant, parents, um, we didn't have a TV in our home till I was uh, 16 years old. So music was always a big thing. Dad sang tenor, mom played the piano. And, uh, but they had a lot of records and they had this uh, record player that had two turntables. Uh, one was for playing records and the other one was for cutting records. And they would send these uh, things back and forth to the family still in Holland. And that's how they communicated with one another. Anyway, that led to building speakers and building tube amps and stuff, and um, it was just uh, kind of, uh, it just kind of happened uh, naturally. And, um, and then um, a high-end store opened up in a town nearby, and I went there and listened to what they had and told the people that were running it that, uh, you know, I made my own speakers, and I think they're pretty good. Every retailer's nightmare. Uh, would would you like to hear them? And um, they said, yeah. So brought them over there, and they said, wow, those are really weird, And uh, but they sound awesome. Uh, let's go to CES. And I said, CES, what's that? And they said, well, it's a consumer electronics show in Chicago. So in 77, we rented a van and drove to Chicago, and I was still working, so um, ended up with our initial 15 dealers, and... Uh, I don't know how many pairs of speakers ordered, and I was making one pair a week in my garage. So that's how Vandersteen Audio started. Great, thank you. Um, how would you briefly sum up your philosophy as a business person, as an engineer and manufacturer? And second part, has your philosophy or approach evolved over time? I think if you're going to do it, do it right. And it hasn't changed over the years. Um, this is very similar to what uh, Cheryl Lee said, and, uh, and that is I, I, I divide it into two categories. One is concepts, and the other is execution. And uh, we believe that uh, uh, decisions that you make about business, decisions that you make about uh, dealer networks, uh, designs, manufacturing, and so forth, should be based on concepts which are which are noble and uh, as advanced as you're capable of of uh, realizing and doing, and then they should be executed 
at the highest quality standard. Uh, and that, of course, means that uh, they're not going to be the least expensive products. Uh, they will be costly, uh, but there's usually a small but very um, uh, dedicated uh, group of people who want something that's really good. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that, that has guided our, 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 our business. Of course, a very important thing is that the money aspects of our business were always handled by Cheryl, not me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so I stuck to the, uh, the design and engineering and so forth. Um, I think for me, it's a, it's a product driven um, business for me. I, I get an idea and I look around to see if anyone's done it and then I decide if I want to try it and I start to develop a product and as it gets more and more complicated, that's how I figure out how it's going to be priced. Um, I think that, that having done a, a, a lot of different product designs, I think that I find now that, that I would tend to agree with Dave, you just have to do it the best way you can possibly do it. And uh, I, uh, I think that that's a good philosophy and I've been, I've been doing that with uh, D'Agostino Master Audio Systems and really working on making the product better than anything that I can possibly make it. So I, I believe that uh, uh, the end user that buys a product like mine or Dave's or, or, or uh, Richard's, I, I think they really, uh, they really have a reason to buy it. I mean, because anyone can make a box with parts in it, but can you make a box with parts in it that works incredibly well and looks beautiful and makes music that people want to buy? Well, initially we did a lot of live versus recording and, um, and comparisons and tried to uh, design a loudspeaker that had as little character of its own and uh, try to make a speaker as good as it could be for as little money as possible and because uh, I didn't see it to be a challenge to make an expensive speaker that was good um, and that's what got me out of bed in the morning and then re you know in the last uh, 15 years you get tired of always having to design to a price point at least I did and uh, and I said, you know, it's it would be fun to just design some one. Now they're all based on the same work that we discovered over 40 years ago, so the design hasn't changed. But it'd be nice to just throw if this is better or that's better, no matter what it's cost, not worry about it. Finish the product, make it work, and then put a price on it and hope it sells. And um, so that's more what the last 10 or 15 years have been like for us. And um, really, it didn't matter that much if we didn't sell a lot of them because the other stuff was carrying the load anyway. Uh, but it's kind of like a present to myself for all the years working, and uh, and they have sold very well. So just uh, it's all basically the same stuff, just more or less of it for more or less money. Great. Um, what product first put you on the map? And second part, what product are you most proud of? Well, the first product that put us on the map was um, probably our recordings. But as far as the speaker, it was the Wham, our first product. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came onto the market, the most expensive speaker was the IRS, which was $20,000. Uh, it was probably good that we did not have the business courses telling you you needed to build up because we leapfrogged that at 28000 and introduced it at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show. And that was, as they say, that was the start of our history. I think Cheryl Lee got it right. <laughs> the one you're most proud of. Oh, most proud of. Well, um, gosh, what I'm really proud of is our company because the, the company uh, has, has grown and, and we've got about 50 full-time employees now and the average tenure 
is uh, about 14 years. And so there's a lot of depth of experience and every single one of these people is a pleasure to work with. And so much they share the original vision, you know, and they, and they, um, they take personal satisfaction in doing the best they can. And I love that. It's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Uh, as a product, I, I would say the Master Chronosonic because it's, it, it's a speaker I always wanted, but didn't know how to do and didn't have the company that could do it and so forth. And so I consider myself very, very fortunate to, uh, to actually be able to uh, execute that product. For me, it was the uh, Krell KSA 100, and um, it was uh, it was, to put it bluntly, wildly successful when I first introduced it. You know, it was hard getting into dealers, but um, a lot of people from foreign countries just wanted to buy it, and I found myself getting some people ordering 10 and 15 amplifiers at one time from me, and. I had only built three when I went to the Consumer Electronics Show. Uh, so that was, a, that was like a pretty crazy time. I think the product I'm most proud of is the uh, Momentum uh, M400 uh, amplifier. Uh, it's, uh, it's an embodiment of my work uh, in it, and it's, everything just turned out right with it. So I'm, I'm most proud with that product. I would have to say the Model 2. It's uh, the R&D and everything that went into that created the, what we is the foundation of what we're still making today. The Baffleus design, which was not done in those days, it was new, and the stagger, all of that stuff was, um, um, you know, kind of a uh, few of us playing around with that, and, and uh, it's the basis of what we still do today. And uh, there's a lot of audio files. Maybe I don't know. A lot, I'm sure there's uh, several of you here that had a pair of two something somewhere in their audio career. And um, yeah, I'm I, I'm just proud of the happiness, the thousands and thousands and thousands of pairs of those that we sold that have um, given them people a lot of joy. Um, so um, I would say that was what I'm proudest of also. Great. What do you see for the future of high-end audio? I think it's a changing market. Uh, when we first came in, um, you had dealers, and mm -hmm. dealers had their territories that were very protected. With the, the internet, it's, it's a changing world. And uh, as brick and mortar stores seem to be kind of disappearing. Uh, I think that we will have to maybe change with the times, doing more regional things. Uh, maybe more people get excited and open brick and mortar stores. But uh, I think the high-end audio and the experience that we can offer is here to stay. It's just in, in what iteration it will be. Uh, I like to look at things that um, I see as being permanent. And one thing that is permanent is music, love of music. Not everybody resonates with it, uh, but there are many that do, and uh, that doesn't go away. You don't outgrow it as you get older. It moves you in a way, it communicates with you in a way that verbal language can't. And there's an infinite variety of genres and styles and all that. There's music to please everyone. That's not going to go away. So that will not be exchanged for video games, for example. Another thing that seems to be permanent is when you really love an activity, if you love going to art galleries, or if you love listening to music and so forth, how joyful it is to share it with somebody else who also loves it. 
and you can talk about things and share the excitement and it's and it and it's a catalyst so that both of you actually receive more joy from it by sharing headphones make that a little difficult loudspeakers work better for the social aspect of it so regardless of the form of the uh, program source I think that music will be there and uh, and then there's another thing that's permanent and that is people love to improve the quality of their lives and one way of doing that is for those things that you love to make them even more meaningful to you so I know that's a generalization, but I think that it's a good way to look at it. I think that um, the music business has a, has a future because there's more people listening to music than ever before and more, more quantity of music. People actually own thousands and thousands of downloads. And not that it's recorded in the best way, but it is, it is definitely a way to enjoy a, a, a multiplicity of different musical parts. I, I, I don't think there's any time in history where people could own more music than they have now, which, which means that most of it's being listened to on headphones or, or with iPods or whatever device. But I think eventually as, as this generation gets older, that is, becomes too private, and as Dave says, you share music when you listen to it over a good audio system. I think that that aspect will come, and when that comes, there'll be a lot of people looking to buy audio gear. Um, all of us up here are, are part of, uh, of the specialty end of um, our business, and this has always been the case where the definition of specialty is few people care. But that few people um, will always be there. And this is true in everything in life, whether it be automobiles, cars, uh, wines. Uh, not everyone wants to push the envelope and get involved to the degree of anything that we make up here. But there's always going to be that group that, that, that is passionate about it, that wants to push the envelope, that wants to experience more uh, musical enjoyment out of their systems. And like Dave said, music will always be with us. Um, for me, uh, the reason that I really, really listen as much as I do is it's a lot healthier than taking Valium. And um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's just a way to unwind, it's a way to entertain, it's so versatile. Um, but I learned at one of my first reunions where um, uh, Steve Perry is, is a friend of mine and was born in Hanford, same time uh, town I was born in. And we'd go to, you know, the, to our first reunion and he, he, he was already in a band. I was starting out making uh, loudspeakers and the local newspaper had done a two-page spread about Vandersteen Audio and so of course uh, a lot of people wanted to know, and on Saturday we all went down to the factory. Uh, not all of us, obviously, but there were about 40 people wanted to come see the factory, and we had a system there, and we played it. And and out of the 40 people, we lost 35 when they figured out, oh, that's all how loud it'll play. They equate the investment as to how loud it'll play. So they went out the door thinking uh, those guys are crazy for spending that kind of money, and then. Um, you know, in the end, there were one or two of us left that understood what imaging was, that understood what the whole experience was about. And out of the 40, maybe one, you know, there were probably four or five thought it was pretty neat and could understood, understand it with more exposure to it, but maybe only one that would invest in it. That's just the way it is. It's always been that way. And uh, I think it will continue. How we sell it, like Cheryl said, may change. I think in the end, though, people need to touch and feel it. Um, they need to be able to experience that these shows are one way to do that. But one of the most important parts of putting a stereo together is having somebody to make sure 
that there's a synergism between all of the great equipment that's available out there because it's as important as a component. And that will always, you can do that by a lot of experimentation and spending a lot of money or you can have a good consultant help you. But um, so I think there will always be brick and mortar stores and hopefully more in the future. Yes. And Kevin Hayes from VAC has just joined us. Thank you. Apologies for being late. <laughs> Great. Uh, what products or designs from other manufacturers have impressed you and why? Anyone? Yes. Go, I'll, go. Take, I'll take that there. Um, one of the most impressive was when I first experienced the quad ESLs. Uh, I was in the Air Force in England, and they were selling a mono then. They were, they were kind of gold colored. And first of all, that it made sound was intriguing, but the purity of it in the, in the mid-range was captivating. And to this day is a goal all of the technology that I have been working on for cones, trying to make pistonic drivers and everything, has been a goal of trying to get that, that lack of character, not in the highs and the lows, there were compromises there and there were dynamic issues, but there was a naturalness to the way piano and voice sounded on those that, um, and it's the only pair of speakers that I've personally ever purchased that I didn't build myself. So I still have them. I think um, <clears throat> classically, um, the Clipshorn impressed me. Uh, KLH-9s as uh, pairs. The uh, Ortofon SPE GT moving coil cartridge. Amazing cartridge. They still love it in Japan. Uh, later on, um, getting into the 70s and 80s and so forth, uh, there was this amplifier that I fell in love with. Uh, at the time, I was uh, a, a part-time reviewer for the Absolute Sound magazine, and I wrote a review about it. It was called the Krell KSA 100. <laughs> um, that was very impressive to me. Uh, the Marantz Model 9 preamplifier and uh, the Marantz 7C preamplifier. Cheryl one year gave me a Marantz 10B FM tuner for Christmas, uh, and uh, which we still have. Uh, currently, um, uh, I have to look at equipment for my specific needs, uh, which include do I love it, but more important, does it satisfy the needs that I have? And, uh, you know, I'm very fond of the M400s, very fond, the VTL Siegfrieds. Uh, regrettably, I don't have much experience with Kevin's very fine amplifiers, uh, just circumstances. Um, I like the Lyra cartridges. Uh, I'm very drawn to um, technologies that are refined in the time domain. And, uh, you know, classically, I love Richard Vandersteen's speakers. I remember, you know, I recommended those to a number of people. And uh, I remember the first time I heard them, and I just thought, wow, these things are good. How does he do it at that price? <laughs> so, um, you know, we live in, in a time and in an industry where we have almost an embarrassment of riches. There's so much good equipment. So that's my two cents worth. I think if I look at uh, my history with audio equipment, I, um, I was fascinated with uh, open reel tape uh, for a while. And I think one of the things that I got in, probably only Dave here will remember, and maybe Richard, the uh, Wallensack recorder with the three motors in it, which I thought was just the, the, the coolest mechanical device you could own. Mm -hmm. And that really, really tweaked me uh, as, as I went through my, my, my things with tape. And then um, I have to say some of the uh, early direct drive turntables were fascinating until I, until I heard what was wrong with them. 
but uh, <laughs> but it, it was fascinating to have a motor like that to me. Uh, I, I think right now um, uh, I find most impressive is what Dave Wilson does. And he's taken a concept of time delay and brought it to a pinnacle that is extremely precision. And, I, I, and it's a, a lineage from the beginning of his product line all the way up, because I was there when Dave introduced the Wham. Uh, and I think it's, a, I think it's a, 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 a monumental thing to stay with one idea and just make it better and better and better and better and better. And he's done that admirably. Well, Dave has mentioned almost all of my favorites, too. But one of the recent ones uh, is the DCS clock, which has helped in the timing uh, area, which is something that we're passionate about. And also, uh, to say, all of my children that come in absolutely love your designs, Dan. Uh, they're, they achieve your um, pinnacle of excellence in sound, but also in aesthetics. Uh, you've taken the, the concept of, of watches, as we have in the Master Chronosonic, and uh, brought that concept of, of beauty and timing into our industry. Yes, all yours. <laughs> Would you actually, uh, here's a, a nice joke line. Would you repeat the question? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, no problem. Um, I was asking uh, which products or designs have most impressed you and why from uh, other we're, manufacturers? Some other manufacturers. We're, we're not talking necessarily current, but historic as well. In, any okay. of your choosing. You know, in a, in a, a company like this, there are, there are so many fine things being developed. And I think as designers in this day and age, we have the great luxury of standing on the shoulders of generations of people who've done much fine work. So um, in some ways, I think of our job almost as being easier than the, the work that I would have seen when I was first becoming aware of electronics and of stereo. And so the first thought that I had in response to your question were the things that actually began to get me thinking about what eventually becomes a career like, like we all at the table have. And um, I think the, the points that really began to get me thinking were when I encountered um, first the uh, uh, Fisher X101C and the Citation II Harman Kardon. And that's because those products, the Fisher being a relatively modest piece of equipment, in all honest terms, the way it stood out compared to what was being offered to me as a young audiophile in the mid-1970s was the surprise. When you, you take your hard-earned money and you buy this new, in my case, a Lafayette receiver with you know 900 semiconductors crammed in there, um, and then hear it not making music the same way that some piece which is 15 or 20 years old and very simple and actually relatively modest in price. And so that began, for me, the investigation of trying to figure out why these two products sound so obviously different. And uh, just very amateurish investigations initially for a teenager with an oscilloscope and a signal generator. And you begin to see very different behaviors of, of products under different conditions. And if you couple that with a passion for trying to bring music back to life, in your home, it winds up becoming a relentless pursuit. And then you get to deeper understandings and refinements, and uh, suddenly you find out uh, that you can do something you love for a living. Um, other things that were very influential back in that era were the, the first moving coil cartridges I ever heard, the Signet MK111, for example. The first time you encounter a Lynn turntable in that era, going from a Techniques direct drive, and suddenly this very funky, fiddly British thing um, is making more music, and you begin to wonder how that could be. Triumph of refinement over uh, high technology, I guess, in some ways. Thank you. Now we'd like to open the floor for audience questions. Excuse me. You yes. Ask? Yeah, I started. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll come to you. <laughs> okay. Questions? Okay. Oh. This might be tricky. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Should I take the mic? 
Uh, please describe your home system. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. That's an air conditioner and a thermostat <laughs> on the front door. <laughs> We have several. <laughs> so if we discount the, the systems that we have at the factory, um, then in, uh, we have um, in our music room, which is the, the primary system, we have um, a turntable designed and built by a man that I just loved so much. That was A.J. Conti. I bought his first turntable. It was called the DW1, and I felt so honored by that. We have a basis inspiration turntable. We've got four basis vector four arms with different cartridges in each one, and you can change from one cartridge to another in six minutes and have the VTA and the, the style of everything correct on it. Um, he has a cartridge garage. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, our tape machine is a 30 inch per second, half inch, half track Ultramaster. Uh, the electronics are all custom designed by John Curl, and we've recorded quite a few recordings with that, that machine. We have a DCS uh, Vivaldi uh, stack. Um, the, uh, the phono preamplifier is an audio research uh, phono ref 10. Uh, the preamplifier that we use is a VTL 7.5 series 3. Uh, the electronic crossovers are Wilson Audio watch controllers. The tuner is a Marantz 10B. Um, the, um, the preamplifier has to be able to drive 72 foot runs of interconnect which the VTL does, but some preamplifiers, which I also like, can't. It's too much capacitance. The power amplifiers we have for uh, solid state, we have the M400 D'Agostinos, and for tubes, we have the VTL Siegfried uh, Series 2's 240 volt version, and the speakers are Wham Master Chronosonics, and the subwoofers are Wham Master Subsonics and that's the system. Better than the system he had when I first met him. <laughs> cables? Uh, are the cables are all transparent. Um, my system comprises of uh, a pair of experimental amplifiers I'm working on. My preamp, my phono stage, I have uh, Air Force 3 and a Graham tone arm. Uh, I have uh, DCS Vivaldi parts, the whole stack, and I have um, and I have a pair of Wilson uh, Alexandria twos that are soon to become traded in to a to another Wilson product, um, and uh, all the cabling is uh, transparent. And I have a server that I built that I use. Uh, for listening to music uh, uh, on the, uh, that's recorded on hard drive. And I think that pretty much uh, sums up my system. Uh, see, I have, uh, I don't have Wilson's, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have. We can correct that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I use uh, seven Mark IIs. I use our liquid-cooled single-ended amplifiers um, to, that are designed for that. It's, it's like a powered speaker with leaving the customer the option. Um, the uh, preamp is uh, experimental uh, that I've been playing with for a lot of years. The uh, turntable is a Brinkman with a triplanar tone arm and a Lyra cartridge. Uh, ATR tape machine. Um, and it was worked over by the tape project people. That's all I know about it. It sounds great. And I don't have any digital. <laughs> AudioQuest. Uh, eh, mostly AudioQuest. Uh, my system is kind of an unfair representation right now because my wife and I are doing some remodeling in the home. 
and uh, the main system is not in operation, so it's a, more like an office system. Um, VAC signature preamplifier, VAC signature 200 power amp, um, Shunyana Anaconda cabling, um, VPI Classic 3 turntable, um, Ortofon Winfeld cartridge, um, and in that particular room, shoehorned in a pair of Tannoy Yorkminster SE loudspeakers, Ampex 350 tape machine, Marantz MR, um, pardon me, Marantz 10B, which I've had now for I think 25, 30 years myself. What a neat tune of that is. Real quality piece of work. And uh, VAC DAC and uh, AccuPay's uh, transport. Thank you. Other questions? Okay. <laughs> yes, how much of your success do you attribute to Harry Pearson as far as uh, the high end and letting people be aware of it? He's not a plant, by the way. <laughs> okay, anyone? Well, Harry Pearson, um, he and I are, you know, we're very different people. Uh, but I just, I grew very fond of him. He's a very complex guy. I, many of you know him. And uh, very complex. But um, I thought about him a lot. And we had a lot of really good conversations. Uh, and uh, Gordon Holt in, uh, really in, created the, the idea and the, the widespread understanding that you know, something can measure great and sound bad, and it is bad. And that was revolutionary back then in 1963 and 64. But it was Harry Pearson who created a vocabulary. And it was a colorful, intuitive vocabulary because it correlated the sensory systems of vision and sound. And, um, and then a, a bunch of music-loving audiophiles like all of us could talk about the sound of a piece of equipment that the other person had never heard before, and yet that other person would get an idea of what it sounded like. And so, and then uh, Harry also added a huge measure of style to it. How many of you remember Robbie Wesson's artwork? Yeah. And, and yeah. the size, the perfect size of those little journals. It's, it was wonderful. It was just absolutely wonderful. So um, I think all of us in the industry owe a great deal to Harry Pearson, not just those of us on, the, on this table. I remember uh, during my grad school era always running to the music library or to a different city to, to a... Sorry about that. That's okay. Just um, echoing um, what Dave was saying, I remember in graduate school days becoming aware of the journal format stereophile and absolute sound. And you would know what day to go to the music library to read a copy or exactly what day the bookstore in the next town over was going to receive the copy to run out and buy it. And I think that uh, most of us read those magazines uh, very closely and really uh, got a lot out of them. Mm -hmm. And um, the entire lexicon of equipment in terms of music as opposed to hi-fi terms. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, if, if someone walks into your room and says, oh, how transparent that sounds, mm -hmm. you know you failed. <laughs> they should be talking about the music when they first hear the system with, with our products in them. And I think we owe a lot to that. And he was, I think, gracious to a great many of us, which is interesting. And he was a very insightful man in many ways. Mm -hmm. I always remember him uh, commenting that he thought to a large degree, when you listen to a piece of equipment, you were hearing the soul of the designer. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice way of saying everything we design and build embodies our idea of quality and, and passion mm -hmm. and music. And uh, that's pretty deep thinking. Thank you. Saw another hand over here. Okay. Okay. Sure. Dave, I noticed that uh, one of your recordings made it back onto the Absolute Sound Superdisc list, uh, best of the bunch, and I own all those recordings in vinyl. Thank you. 
Um, I love the re organ recordings because the James Welch and that because I collect organ records uh, quite quite a bit. Uh, I'm just wondering, is your recording career over, or is there any other plans to do some? You know, my heart is going this way, and then my reality is going this way, and that that great saying that you can, if you're fortunate, you can do anything you want, but nobody can do everything they, they want. And um, we've got friends in the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra that, you know, they've talked about forming a chamber orchestra and doing all that stuff, and, and I just think, you know, I would love to do that. But we've got 14 grandchildren. <laughs> and um, I'm 10 years older than I was 10 years ago. And, and I'm fortunate to still be vertical. Uh, so uh, I think it probably is. Um, it would probably do my heart good to do it. Not if I tried to lug the Ultramaster around again. That would be very bad. <laughs> never say never. Okay. Okay. In your perspective, uh, disciplines, what was the hardest problem that you had to solve in research and development? Uh, who is the question? Uh, uh, the, 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 oh, good. Oh, good. Good. Well, <clears throat> for me, the most difficult thing is to find, um, uh, it's, it's materials based. Um, and for me, cones and domes best um, represent the way I want to move air through space. And, um, and um, to find diaphragms that that exactly follow the lead of the voice coil, which is in turn following the lead of the amplifier signal fitted, um, has been a very, very difficult challenge and um, expensive and, and um, um, but on the, on the other hand, very rewarding. Um, and it's fairly recent too, uh, working on that like 15 years or so to the point to where you can call them truly pistonic at all frequencies that they're using, which is still very rare today. But we didn't really have a very good way of measuring it. Um, a company called Clipple now has made a device where we can visually see the behavior of these cones at all different frequencies. And um, that in itself is a big help because the problem before was to find out whether it was breaking up with two mics, positioning them and mixing them and watching a VU meter. Did it go up? Did it go down? Oh, that means that part's out of phase. with Because uh, literally you have parts of the cone out of phase with other parts of the cone. This is primarily one of the reasons why most loudspeakers have every other driver out of phase. Because by the time you get to the higher end of the lower driver, it is actually out of phase, and the next driver's still pistonic. So in order to get that to blend without a hole in the response curve, you'd have to wire them out of phase. But uh, that's been very difficult work. On the other hand, if it's easy, it's, you know, there, there's value, you know, it's, when it's difficult, it means more. It's, it's, it, it's a, also more rewarding. I think for me the hardest thing to do would be uh, when to when to draw the line and say the product's finished. Oh, yeah. that's that's a real hard thing to do. I agree with that one. What? Um, when you ask the question in terms of R and D, it makes it sound very much like a materials and techniques question. And you know, in that regard, you can look at things in our case like the. Uh, the IQ stable biasing system, which we patented, that took about 20 years of R&D for us to achieve, and at many points I thought it would never actually be possible, um, or the design of an output transformer, things of that nature. But really the biggest challenge we faced is probably in some ways more difficult for an amplifier manufacturer than for a loudspeaker designer, is 
electronics tend to behave better than transducers to begin with. So we're at a, in some ways, more subtle or more slippery part of the art. And you, you begin crossing a bridge, I would argue, between the science of the design and the measurement it makes and the sound you actually hear. When you hit that point where you can change an internal hookup wire in an amplifier from a particular mil-spec wire from plant A to the same mil-spec wire from plant B, and the amplifier sounds audibly different in double-blind testing, you're in a whole new area where it's, the measurements aren't quantifying what's happening. But to get from hi-fi to music, you have to deal with all those things. And it winds up being a multi-dimensional, subjective uh, process to go through getting the ingredients and the recipe to play in the way that that is true to the music and which conveys the emotion as well as the the hi-fi attributes. Um, that really is the biggest challenge. And in all candor, I will never live long enough to fully optimize any one product because you know how many hundreds of wires are available, how many brands of metal film resistor can you buy and what different ratings the degrees of freedom in the problem mathematically are intractable. So you wind up knowing what things have tended to do before, what things you think you should try, and you take the best dimensions you know to experiment with and cover them in the best ranging way you can. Um, some of it's a bit like a computer search. You don't search every single number. You go to the middle of the string and see whether you're high or low, and then you go to the next middle point and and do a, a radix search that way, for example. So uh, the hardest thing is just going from, it measures great on the test bench, to saying, yes, I want to put my name on that, and I'm proud of the way that reproduces music. <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, uh, to say something on two points. Um, uh, first, there are either four or five Wilson audio recordings in the current uh, absolute sound, super LP list, uh, and there will be more. And I sincerely hope that even though you're 10 years older and feel 10 years older, I'm 10 years older and I feel 20 years older, so there's, a, there's that. I sincerely hope that you find your way back into the recording studio because, well, the WC recording alone is only the greatest recording of uh, chamber music ever made on the, the the super super part of the super disc list you're a great recording engineer and on the subject of Harry Pearson my late mentor I had a um, I, I wouldn't uh, have turned to writing about audio if it weren't for Harry I, I've told this story I don't know how many times but I'm going to tell it again I had published a book on RCA records, and I published a novel that had to do with audiophiles, and he found out about both. Somehow or another, he got my phone number, which wasn't listed. I still don't know how he got it, and he called me up, and I don't know how many of you spoke to Harry, ever talked to him, but he had a very deep voice. He sounded like a DJ. I mean, he had a very deep voice. So out of nowhere, this guy says, hello, I'm Harry Pearson. Well, I'd published ten novels at that point, and I was pretty well known, but I was in awe. I'd been reading Harry since I was a kid, you know, and I, I didn't know what to say. I said, I, I feel like I'm talking to God. And, and there was a pause, and he said, no, God is talking to you. <laughs> that sounds good. And to tell you the truth, that's the way I'm always going to think about him. Um, he was a difficult guy, don't kid yourself. Harry was not uh, a bed of roses, but he was a really brilliant thinker. Uh, and everybody's just attested to that. It wasn't just the way Harry heard. I uh, he used to say, well, you have great ears. He says, no, he says, I have a great mind. And he did. He was a really good thinker about what he heard. And I'm hopeful that we're, we're continuing that legacy because that's what it's about. It's thinking about what you're listening to, developing that language that makes it possible for people to, to exchange ideas about stuff that's ineffable, that's, that's instantaneous, that's gone as soon as you hear it. Um, 
I did want to tell a story about Harry and Dan D'Agostino that Dan may not know. Um, apparently, Harry went over to Dan's house at one point. This was probably in the mid-'80s, I guess. And uh, Dan, at that point, was using Apogee's, I, I believe. And Harry, I think, must have still been using IRSs or whatever the hell he was using. And he went over to Dan's house, and he listened to his Apogee's with his own amplifiers, obviously. And Dan must have said, well, what do you think? And Harry said, oh, it's all right. <laughs> it wasn't just all right. <laughs> Harry told me that it was the best sound he'd ever heard. But he didn't want to tell Dan that, you know. <laughs> so he went home, and he spent like two weeks trying to get his system to sound like Dan's system, and he couldn't do it. So uh, anyway, Dan, in case you didn't know. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, uh, let's give a round of applause for these wonderful people.